So thank you very much for uh, this invitation. I, I really want to apologize for my poor English. Uh, anyway, I'm very more fluent in uh, German, for example, but my English is not my first um, my first foreign language. Uh, anyway, I'm trying to teach you so some uh, some things in the uh, about common agricultural policy. Uh, I think it's better on the So I'm, as, as you saw, uh, I'm researcher and a teacher in uh, so in economics, but also in agronomy because I am in a in a team of researchers. Uh, which tries to have a very pluridisciplinary approach of the agriculture. Anyway, I work, uh, I work really um, with uh, agronom agronomics, in agronomic sciences and so on, more than e economics anyway. Um, perhaps I, I can also uh, precise which is uh, my point of view about all these questions, because I think that uh, no economist is uh, uh, always uh, uh, neutral concerning obviously these questions, and uh, we have all uh, we all have uh, very special approaches of one question. Anyway, I was counselor of the European Com Commissioner on Agriculture a few years ago, but I am also very involved as expert um, in a platform uh, which gathers. Um, NGOs, environmental NGOs, also Confédération Paysanne, which is not the main agricultural uh, trade union, farm trade union, uh, also with international NGOs and so on. So this is a very special point of view, a, a very large platform of uh, 40 NGOs and uh, peasant organizations, uh, which try to have another point of view uh, different from uh, the point of view of the main farm trade union anyway. And uh, more and environmental and social issues, I, I would say that than the main farm trade union. And um, yeah, so that's why, but anyway, I'm also in the Academy of, of Agriculture, which is a very conservative uh, instance. So anyway, I have to work with all these uh, words. <laughs> But so I am very involved in the expertise on this question. Anyway, um, and uh, I would I would like to precise that because the text that I uh, offer to you to read is uh, a, a text <coughs> written by the European Food Sovereignty Platform, which gathers on the European level all these NGOs, perhaps hundreds of NGOs, but which is not the point of view of the main trade unions. Uh, of farmers, and this is also not the point of view of neoliberal economics and uh, economists on this uh, on this question. So, um, so now perhaps uh, I would like to present some challenges uh, of agriculture now. Um, anyway, here this is a point of view of uh, this platform this European platform, but I would say that this is also shared by the Ministry of Agriculture anyway, uh, because the gen there was a diagnostic of uh, cap of common agriculture policy and agriculture, which, which was written one year ago. And I think that all the stakes that uh, are presented here are also in this diagnostic diagnostic. Diagnosis, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Diagnosis of the Ministry of Agriculture. But we will, you, we will see that the conclusions are not the same. <laughs> um, so anyway, first of all, uh, commercial prices and income issues. Uh, first of all, it's important to, under, to underline that there is a positive and increasing agri-food trade balance for European Union. Um, so, but there are very different situations of each country, and even if there is a positive agri-food trade balance since the uh, um, 2000 uh, years, I would say that there are limits of that because there is a very unbalanced trade balance now, with a specially sizable imports and incre uh, increasing imports of fruits Oleaginous crops also from South America. You, you know perhaps that uh, the soya for animal food 
uh, is uh, hugely imported from South America and North America. Perhaps 80% uh, of soya is imported now for the food animal, for the animal food, sorry. And um, so all this soya is GMOs, uh, is with GMOs. So there is, a, an, this is impossible to know if there are GMOs or not in this uh, soya uh, imported from South and North America. Which, uh, <coughs> which is quite problematic because if we do not want uh, GMOs in animal food, this is impossible to know if there are animal food in this uh, soya. That's why now there is a problem because more and more um, uh, animal production, like in the Comté, you know, the cheese from, uh, from the Jura in the east of France, this is a, an appell a protected appellation. They don't want uh, animal food with GMOs, but there is very many difficulties to find uh, soya without GMOs. So uh, it's well, so it's very, uh, a big limit because uh, because of this dependency on soya from South and North America, which do not respect anyway uh, the the main preferences of consumers in EU anyway. Uh, but also there is a sizable and increasing uh, importation of fruits, for example, from uh, outside from France and outside from European Union. And a strong dependency from some countries for exportation, especially USA and China outside the European Union. And um, also uh, linked to and um, dependent from a geopolitical situation. For example, in 2014, there was an embargo, embargo yeah, decided from, uh, from uh, the Russia uh, because, you know, of geopolitical uh, results. And uh, there, was a, there, there, there were big impacts on the agricultural production uh, in EU, especially for production, bovine production and so on, because we were very dependent on this exports and anyway uh, because of this embargo we had to so we had to compensate with other exports and so on and finally uh, I, yeah I have to mention also um, the problem of uh, the imports and exports um, of the France relatively to the Euro, uh, to the other European countries, as you know, there is a, in France, the trade balance is, uh, is now more and more uh, decreasing. The, the food, so the, the net exportation of uh, France is more and more decreasing and there are more and more uh, imports from the European Union to the France. And anyway, what we can see is that the, the competition inside the EU is uh, stronger and stronger more perhaps than uh, the, uh, the other countries outside the EU, anyway. And especially from Spain, from uh, Netherlands, uh, from Poland also. And there is a problem of uh, environmental and social situations because you know that there is, no, there is no minimal wage, for example, in European Union. And there is a competition from other European countries, which have lower wages, which have lower environmental conditions uh, sometimes. And it is a reason for the main trade farm union, FNSO in France. This is a reason to say, you know, we have this competition inside the European Union, so we do not have to increase the European constraints and the short search constraints. You, you, you understand? And this is the main reason for FNSO to uh, face, to uh, to oppose to any environmental and social progress into France. For example, the question of the glyphosate, I don't know if this is right. pesticides anyway. So they refuse to, uh, uh, to move out the herbicides and, and pesticides and so on, phytosanitary products, uh, because uh, they say that, and it is true, that in other European Union, they use this and uh, so we cannot be, as farmers, uh, less competitive than the other farmers in European Union. 
Um, so here, um, other issues. This is uh, issues of farming crops, as you can see here. Um, the main aspects of farm income is the volatility of farm incomes, as you can see, and we, we, will, we will see why there, there are stable incomes um, until uh, 2000 or 2010, um, quite stable incomes, but now we have very uh, volatile incomes because of the price volatility and because of the deregulation of agricultural markets since the since the 90s, anyway. Um, and so, first of all, volatility of farm income, and secondly, strong inequalities between farms and productions, and between farms especially. Um, there is a stronger uh, rate of poverty in uh, agriculture than in other sectors. And um, so it is not true to think that there are very low uh, farm incomes for every farmers like the FNSOA says, this is not true anyway. Uh, the statistics used are, are false anyway, I, I could explain why, because uh, it uh, takes into account, uh, it don't take into account the fiscal, um, uh, the, the fiscal optimization, we, we could say, okay, the, the fiscal optimization, so the, uh, the farm incomes is the statistics are not true anyway, and uh, there is no very low farm income for everyone. The, 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 <laughs> what is true is that there are very strong farm inequalities between farms. And uh, obviously this is not what is uh, uh, underlined <laughs> by uh, the FNSOA and the, farm, uh, the main tri farm trade unions, only by the, the farm trade unions, which represent the little farms, which are the farms which have the weaker, uh, the weakest uh, weak incomes. Uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate to put them. This is fine. Okay, you understand all of I explain. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I would like to explain uh, the developments of incomes and production and so on uh, for 60 years uh, for understanding what is happening now. There is a huge increase of the volume of agricultural production. It was, it was doubled during uh, 60 years uh, and especially was an increase of heat and more especially of poor productivity. Each farm uh, produces more and more uh, since uh, for uh, 60 years. And um, you can see that here. Okay. Here you have. Um, uh, here you can see. Um, this is the volume of production. The green line is the volume of production. Okay. Uh, so the volume of production was uh, quite doubled. But there is also a, a, a huge decrease of uh, agricultural workers. Okay. So we produce more and more on the national level in France. This is the same in all European countries. Huh? Uh, we, we, so we work, uh, so we produce more and more at the national level with less and less producers. So the result is that we have a, a labor productivity. So the volume of production per worker is uh, stronger and stronger. And, uh, but, and this is what is very interesting in the, the farm sector is that <laughs> uh, we have also, uh, uh, a, gross a gross production, which is decreasing because of the of the strong decreasing of the strong decrease of uh, of the of the agricultural prices. So what what is very important to understand in the agricultural sector is the decrease, the strong huge decrease of agricultural prices since uh, 
so for uh, for 60 years and uh, that's why and you you can see also the green the gray line which is the level of intermediary consumption and the national level and this is very stable so that the gross added value in the agricultural sector is decreasing uh, for 60 years so even if we produce more and more as a national level because of the decrease the huge decrease of of agricultural prices the gross production and the gross added value is dec is decreasing you understand so and um um that's why farm incomes uh maintained only because of the strong increase of raw productivity and the huge dependency on direct subsidies we will see that uh today two-thirds of the national agriculture income is represented by agricultural subsidies so if we do not have agricultural subsidies <laughs> Uh, the, the farm income would be uh, only the third of uh, the farm income today. And uh, there are around 10 billion of euros uh, expended in France, only in France, uh, in one year. And uh, this represents, so around 30, 30 euros per farm. This is quite 20 euros per uh, farmer anyway. Uh, so quite the minimal wage, <laughs> more than the minimal wage per year. So obviously, we can uh, we can think that uh, pack subsidies. So this is so these ten billions are uh, quite are uh, only common from the common agricultural policy. And so that's why we could say that common agriculture policy have a very strong impact anyway on the farm agricultural uh, development in France and all in, in all the European Union. And we will see if this common agricultural policy answers to the ecological and social challenges and how it, it answers to this. Is this fine for you? Okay, uh, yeah, also another aspect which is important to understand is that there is a difference between the agricultural prices paid to the farmers and the food prices paid by the consumers. <laughs> and here, uh, this is uh, the development of the agricultural prices uh, since uh, so far. Uh, 50 years, okay? And this is the development of the food prices for, for 50 years. And you can see that uh, even if the agricultural prices are decreasing more and more, uh, there, is, um, there is not a decrease of food prices. Anyway, there are perhaps two reasons for that. What, what could you, uh, what, what could be the reasons for that? One of them is that uh, the price food, the demand for food is uh, inelastic, and then the producer who sells can maintain the same price to, or even increase a bit the price without any uh, main variation of demand, as it's suggested. So, because of the inelasticity yeah. of demand, and uh, so, yeah, or first reason, okay. Uh, monopsonies or oligopsonies. Buying massively, like Aldi, for instance, in Germany, having a massive market share in buying the things from the farmers so they can put down the price yeah. if you want to sell anything at all. Okay. Second reason, do you think that's another reason? Yeah. If someone also remind them of all what you were selling, it makes them believe that these chilies are markets are good at the same Yeah. So yeah, so all these reasons are um, um, so could be uh, perhaps some uh, so could um, be similar to the reasons I uh, I underlined here. So um, <laughs> two main reasons are underlined, and 
first reason is uh, the fact that there is a more processed food so that the cost of process and distribution is uh, higher, okay? This is a reason which is underlined by the agri-food uh, enterprises anyway. But the second reason which is underlined is uh, even stronger concentration of processing and distribution enterprises anyway, uh, because enterprises are, so uh, enterprises and, and agri-food enterprises are now bigger and bigger and are able to uh, uh, to put pressure uh, anyway on food um, on agricultural prices and uh, this is for example uh, i have an example lactalis which is a, a transnational enterprise the first transnational enterprise of uh, milk products uh, lactalis is collecting uh, one quarter of the milk in france one quarter. Uh, and so, and the producers, even if they try to be organized as uh, uh, groups of producers, they don't manage to, uh, so you know, to put pressure on lactalis. Lactalis is really stronger than uh, the poor farm producers, even if they try to organize themselves and uh, they don't uh, manage to so you know to, to battle against uh, against lactalis and the lactalis and other milk enterprises are more and more concentrated and able to put pressure on uh, agriculture prices so um also about employment and farm structures Example of France here too, but I, I, I will have example from other, other European countries also. In 2016, um, there are uh, 600 of thousands full-time equivalent employments. 3% of working people in agriculture, but you know that more than half of employments were in agriculture sector just after the Second World War. Um, yes, 30 percent, three percent. So now and thirty percent uh, in uh, in 50, 50, 50, 55, Sorry, I, I'm tired. So fifty five. And so there is a, a strong uh, transformation of uh, of the work uh, of the work structure in economy because of this decrease of employment in agriculture and it means 30 uh, 30 thousand employment destroyed destroyed per year uh, for, for for 30 years and this is not far from what appeared in in industrial sector so uh, we we speak a lot about industrial sector anyway, but in the farm sector, there was a huge destruction of employment. Um, yeah, this is, the, this, uh, this is false anyway, I have to cancel that. And what is also very interesting is that um, there is less and less labor force and more and more salaries in agricultural sector. Uh, one third of uh, the work is now uh, uh, is now uh, from salaries and not from uh, farmers in uh, in uh, the agricultural sector in France. And this salaried employment is uh, more and more precarious, with a very big extension of uh, of the law of work in the agricultural sector. And this is uh, also a way to be competitive uh, face, to, uh, face to the rest of the European Union. And uh, for example, the FNSEA uh, managed to have very exem uh, exemption, exemption. exemption uh, in the, for, for, the, for the employment in the agricultural sector. I do not have time to precise this, but uh, anyway, the, uh, the, the law uh, in the work employment is very, um, is very lower uh, than in other economic sectors. 
So a rapid disappearing of farms also with a concentration of land and capital in either larger farms. Uh, we do not have, uh, we have only um, five hundreds of thousands of farms today. Half of farms disappeared in the last last 20 years, particularly little farms, which employ more, more people, and particularly livestock and polycropping production, which is a very big problem for environmental issues because, um, you know, the agroecology, the base, uh, the main aspect, the main base of agroecology is the complementarity between culture and uh, livestock. And with, the, with, uh, uh, with this uh, development, and with the fact that there is a uh, that there, that livestock and polycropping production disappears, there is less and less complementarity into the same uh, farms uh, between livestock and polycrop uh, and polycrops. And anyway, there is also I, I would say that I have to say that uh, also there is a concentration of uh, of crops uh, into the same regions and a concentration of uh, livestock in other regions, for example, uh, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the north, uh, in the north and the west of, uh, of France, but also in Ireland, in the north of Germany, in Netherlands, uh, and so on. And so in concentration of meat production, of livestock production in some regions in European countries, and so that uh, livestock and crops are uh, separated in the, into the space. And this is a big problem, you know? You know why this is a problem? What is the problem? The environmental problem, yeah. Yes, I mean, if you have a massive area with the same crops, then you probably need a lot more pesticides to keep away pests. Yes, obviously. Yeah, so and you, you have also to transport manure from livestock regions to crop regions, and there is also a problem of concentration uh, of pollution from the livestock production anyway. So um, there is no more complementarity and the concentration of, of pollution from uh, the livestock production. And um, yeah, this is the example of France, but you know that there is also a, a question uh, in, the, in the Eastern country of, U of, uh, of Europe, because in some countries like Romania, you have more than 20% than 20 of people which work in agriculture. And the problem is to, uh, to if we have the same model of development in Romania or Poland, in a context of huge um, of, uh, uh, of huge uh, underemployment, what can we do with this? Uh, so, what can we do with uh, this uh, this workers or this uh, this fact that we have less workers in agricultural production? And there is also a problem with all these subsistence and semi-subsistence farms. So, in the context of mass unemployment in these uh, eastern countries. Perhaps the problem is perhaps uh, more huge in these countries than uh, in uh, in the Western countries. And a final problem for farm is the question of uh, of debt. Uh, there is a more indebtedness of farms in France, like in other uh, European countries, which means that this is more and more difficult to. Uh, to be uh, to be a farmer uh, and young farmers have very have very huge difficulties anyway, and there is a huge there is a huge problem of transmission of farms from the farmers to young farmers which would like to uh, to be farmers anyway. Uh, so this is a, so it illustrates what I said about the 
the rate of employment in agricultural sector. You know that in Romania, more, more than 25% uh, of uh, workers in the agricultural sector. In France, this is here, you know. Um, so that's, that means that the problem of, employ of destruction of employment in the farm sector is uh, before all in the, in the Eastern countries. Here also you can see the, the difference of uh, farm structures in European countries. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the average agricultural, uh, the average size of agricultural farms, of farms in, in, uh, in Europe. So this is more than uh, 50 hectares in France, but in Romania, the average size is three hectares. So 60 hectares in France, three hectares in Romania. So you see the difference. And more than 100 hectares in the uh, Czech Republic. So this means that between the, Europe, the, the, the Eastern countries, there are huge differences. Uh, uh, and so uh, this is why there is also a problem in Europe because we have a common agricultural policy for very different agricultures in Europe. Wait. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. All the yeah. all the all the member states. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is all the, the the old member states, the Western countries and the oldest uh, countries of the European Union. Anyway, and uh, this is clear that they they began their uh, agricultural revolution anyway and uh, structuration before all the other countries. This is the first reason. The second reason is that here there are other uh, kind of productions like wine, uh, like fruits, uh, which means uh, more little farms, because the net value, uh, the net added value per hectare, is really higher uh, for this kind of production. You understand? So that's why we have little farms also in this kind of uh, of countries. The West Germany? West Germany? Like yes, uh, also. Uh, yeah, so the, another reason is, um, uh, is uh, the communist uh, period. Because, for example, in the eastern uh, lender of, of Germany, uh, so in the eastern regions of Germany, uh, that, uh, just after the communist period, there was, uh, there was not a separation of the big communist uh, and, uh, states and, or cooperative farms. And they were not divided into all the, uh, the salaries uh, of, of, this, uh, of these farms. That's why uh, and they, they were sold to private investors. That's why they, these farms are so big. This is the same here in the Czech Republic. Contrary to the Romania, where it was separated between all the little uh, salaries and uh, uh, cooperative workers, uh, but it was also the, 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 these very little farms uh, were um, were sold to big investors some, uh, in, in some parts. That's why in Romania, for example, but in all uh, Eastern countries. You have not, um, you have very little farms and also very uh, high farms, very big, big farms. Uh, and not so, um, this is very divided into these two kinds of farms, anyway. Uh, in Romania, like in Poland, and so on. For example, the biggest farm is Romania. The size is uh, nine, 90 of thousands of hectares. Oh, it's amazing, anyway. <laughs> 90 of thousands of hectares. Um, it's, it's fine for you? 
So finally, environmental and health challenges. The agriculture represents around 10% of Europe's greenhouse gas emissions, especially of two gases, uh, the methane and the nitrous oxide emissions. And um, so, uh, because of an increased use of fossil energy, uh, there is a problem also linked to the use of fossil energy. And uh, but I, uh, I think that it's very important to differentiate uh, different uh, different kinds of production. Anyway, uh, the the main responsibility is from uh, the intensive farm production. Okay, and um, especially on biodiversity and uh, water quality. You know that in France, like in a many other countries like Ireland, Netherlands and so on, or Germany, there is an incapacity to respect the European nitrates directive and other environmental directives. Uh, there is a problem on soil quality, uh, especially. And this is due to changing ways of producing for 60 years, more machines, March chemical inputs, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and so on. Decreasing of grassland area, which is very important for the soil and water quality, um, and for kept, for capturing also greenhouse emissions. And uh, I say specialization of farms and regions, less crop rotations. What? Uh, why is? Uh, why are crop rotation? important for environmental issues. <laughs> sure, yeah. So that's why it's important to have different crops and perhaps a second reason? You don't need as much chemical um, like replacements for what you're taking out of the ground. Yeah. And also because of uh, um, so when you have different crops, uh, it cuts uh, the cycle of uh, insects and so on, and uh, also uh, of herbs and uh, and so that's why you need less herbicides and less pesticides and so on. So crop rotations, complementarity between uh, crops and uh, livestock and crop rotations are the base of the agroecology. Anyway. So there are less and less crop rotations and larger cultivated crops, less hedges, less trees, and so on, which are very important for the biodiversity, especially. But also, there are also nutritional and health problems because there is even more consumption of processed food and uh, these large quantities of sugar and fat. And this means increasing product, uh, problems of obesity, for example. Massive use of pesticides, which have had impacts on health consumers, of consumers, obviously. And uh, finally, um, yeah, it's true that we have a recent Development of diversification of activities on farms, short supply chains, quality science, especially organic farming. Uh, organic farming, which represents, for example, uh, in, a, in Europe, 8% um, of agricultural area. But all of this kind of production, all of this kind of production are marginal. Anyway, this is a problem. Yes, it's true, we have more and more organic farming. But this is on, in France, this is only. 8% of agriculture area. And, uh, and anyway, it's, yeah, it don't, it, it don't um, solve the problem of the rest of agriculture production with even more concentrated farms, with even more uh, practices with uh, negative impacts on environment and employment. Yeah. Non, j'ai encore un quart d'heure. 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 Un quart d'
Okay. Uh, I, um, so I, I would like also to explain some uh, uh, some of the history of CAP. Um, so the CAP, you know, was founded uh, just after the Second World War, and with the Treaty of War of Rome, which founded the European uh, uh, area, the European uh, political area, with uh, six member states. Um, and what is important to, to understand is uh, that it was um, coupled to a common market of agricultural products. So anyway, all of these six member states ex accepted these common markets, but with a common agricultural policy. Um, and the, the main objective was to, uh, to have a, a food security for people in the European Union. Because just after the Second World War, there was a big problem of production. We were, uh, we were a debt importer of agricultural products. And uh, so we wanted to be a net exporter or uh, sufficient in agricultural products. And for that, uh, we, uh, this, this, is, uh, this was during a Keynesian period uh, of political economy, and we accepted the idea. Or we, the idea was that market is not an adequate instrument for the long-term management of agricultural supply. So we had to uh, have a, a deconnection between European prices and international prices. And uh, so, uh, we uh, we we uh, we, met, we had a, a strong public action on prices and stabilization of markets for one increasing the productivity of agriculture, ensuring fair life conditions for farm population, ensuring reasonable prices for consumer, warranting warranting food security, and I would like to explain that. Um, we imagined um, so strong uh, regulation tools for strategic production, which were the production of, uh, you know, uh, the, the main uh, Western countries, crops, sugar, corn milk, and uh, meat products. And what was the spirit of that? Uh, here you have raw prices, which are very unstable because of big imperfections of market, which I do not have time to explain why, especially in the agricultural sector, they are very unstable prices. But these prices are very unstable because of inelastic uh, demand, because of uh, uh, also of uh, impossibility to adapt the production to the prices. Uh, and some other reasons. So the idea was to deconnect the European prices, thanks to warranty prices. So when the European prices was uh, equal to quarantine prices, okay, there was a system of um, of uh, stockage by the European Union, okay, public stockage. Sure. Storage, sorry, storage, which allowed to uh, uh, increase the prices and uh, also um, there were uh, variable custom duties, uh, which, uh, which were uh, according to the level of world prices. It's fine for you. And finally, export subsidies, which allowed to uh, sell products to other countries outside the European countries, okay, uh, at the international prices level. It's fine for you. So these agricultural uh, export subsidies were, were paid to exporters, and they were able to uh, resave the European prices, but to sell their products at the international level. It's fine for you. So it's quite a dumping uh, system. <laughs> uh, do you understand this system? Okay. And it 
was accompanied by a structural policy for family and farms. This means that there was investment subsidies, especially focused on, uh, on big farms, not the little farms, only the big farms which were able to prove that they have a model with, uh, a match, with machines and so on. Okay, so all the pluriactive farms, the, the, the little farms, the subsidence and semi subsidence farms were excluded from, uh, from the investment subsidies. And so it uh, allowed uh, to, uh, uh, to favor the concentration of farms. And finally, it was also uh, accompanied by a quota system uh, for the sugar and the milk products. This means that there were a maximum level of production for each member state and each farm. Uh, for example, in France, uh, there was a system, you, you couldn't produce more than your quota uh, in each farm. And why? For, wh what was the, 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 the objective of that? Yeah. I mean, at some point, there were many tiny uh, problems with having too much milk for the system yeah. price would be so exactly. low that there would be no Exactly. Problem. And so it uh, permits to. Uh, counter uh, overproduction anyway. <laughs> Only in sugar and uh, milk production. So uh, main objectives, we, we, we targeted the main objective, increasing investment in agricultural sectors, labor and land increased productivity and we, as we saw, increasing production. And uh, yeah, okay, we had less and less workers in the agricultural sector, but there was a need for the industrial and services sectors and for workers. And uh, finally, it allowed decreasing and stabilized agricultural prices, as we saw, but not food prices anyway. Uh, however, uh, there were big limits also, because since the end of, uh, of uh, of 70s, uh, agri-food production increased in other parts of the world, and there was a stagnation of foreign demand and exchanges. And, uh, but, uh, no, so I don't have time to, to say that. Um, and so there, there was a, uh, there, there was surpluses. So first of all, we had a very big problem of uh, overproduction because of the situation of world markets but also there were budgetary tensions because we exported more and more and we needed more and more agricultural export subsidies and uh, the cap budget um, represented 90% uh, of the eu budget during the during the 70s finally faced to that uh, there was a growing hostility from the UK, which entered into the European Union in uh, 73, uh, especially when Margaret Thatcher uh, was, uh, was uh, prime minister, because she was uh, very liberal, as you know, but also she uh, considered that UK didn't receive uh, enough from the cap and uh, because of that, you know, this was uh, the history of uh, the rebates, the UK rebates into the European Union budget. Uh, so growing UK hostility face to the cap, growing hostility from USA and export countries, because we were more and more exporting uh, our agricultural products, and we were more and more uh, competitors for USA and uh, Argentina and so on. And we entered also into a new period of liberal economic policy. That's why um, uh, in, uh, during, uh, so that's why uh, during the WTO negotiations and agreements of, uh, of 94, agriculture entered completely into the, the WTO agreement as a sector that has to be liberalized as the others. And uh, there was a pressure on all the rich countries 
to uh, dismantle of all of two regulations of prices, uh, exchanges, and so on. And that's why, uh, I do not have time to do this, that's why we decided for all these reasons to uh, deregulate markets and to align the European prices uh, to, so to align the European, uh, European prices to the, the international prices and thanks to the decrease of warranted prices. You understand the scheme? Okay. So the European prices is now the same as the international price because of the decrease of warranted prices, which do not play any role now uh, for uh, regulated prices in the US. What was it in 92 and then? Uh, ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, for the CERAS, this is an example of the CERAS in 92 and 99. And for me, it was during uh, the, it was after 2000. Okay. For the bovine production, uh, the meat pro uh, the meat production, it was also during uh, the 90s. Uh, okay. And sugar, sugar production also after 2000. Uh, okay, and it was compensated by direct payments. Direct payments paid uh, According to production, then it was disconnected to production. It is called decoupled payments. These payments have to compensate farmers because the prices are decreasing, okay? Because they are aligned to national to international prices. And these direct subsidies are paid per hectare. And this is very important to, to understand that because this is a subsidy according to your, uh, uh, to your uh, surface, to your, uh, and not to workers, for example. So it favors, uh, it favors the, the huge uh, of farm, but not uh, your capacity to maintain uh, employment, for example, into your farm, okay? So these decoupled payments, uh, yeah, part, uh, in the same times that we, so uh, there, there, were, there were attempts to regulate volumes of crop productions, but anyway, now uh, uh, there, there are no more tools for regulating uh, production. Uh, it was dismantled into the sugar and milk production and also into the crop production. Anyway, what is important to understand is that there were attempts to uh, control the overproduction thanks to quotas and so on, but now uh, all of this is, uh, is disappearing because of the liberal spirit and the deregulation of markets. Fine for you. Finally, uh, there were attempts to take into account the environmental effects of agriculture, not the social account, uh, not the social impacts, but the environmental effects. So we created less favored area subsidies, agro-environmental measures, which were not uh, automatically paid to farmers, only to farmers in mountains, for, for example, or which have environmental practices uh, higher than the others. All of these were, uh, uh, were gathered into the second layer of the cap. And uh, so this is the second layer of the cap, not, uh, not obligatory measures, only measures and subsidies for farmers which uh, uh, have uh, specific practices or are in specific regions. But there were also, uh, we obligated also all farmers to uh, respect some environmental, environmental conditions for receiving any subsidies after 2003. And uh, this is called uh, the cross compliance, environmental cross compliance. Uh, but anyway, these conditions are some are at the level of the, uh, of the rules 
of the obligatory rules uh, which were already decided. So, for example, you do not have to use uh, some uh, phytosanitary products. This is only the law. And if you respect the law, you can obtain all the, all the subsidies. Okay. There was, uh, there was also the possibility, it was possible to redistribute also cap subsidies towards environmental and tragic production in some countries. France uh, decided to do this. And also the creation of green payments, which uh, have to be uh, higher than the cross compliance. The conditions are quite higher. And this is implemented to uh, Swiss uh, to 30 percent of uh, direct subsidies. Uh, uh, and it was decided uh, during the last uh, reform. And uh, finally, another aspect is that um, CAP is, is more and more nationalized. See, you have to understand that to the European Union, with, uh, uh, with 27 countries, uh, they, they, there are more and more, uh, there are more and more um, tensions between European countries. And this common agricultural policy is less and less common anyway. And uh, the solution to have a common agricultural policy at the European level is to uh, give to every member state um, more and more uh, rooms of maneuver for implementing CAP, the common agricultural policy in each country. Okay. The problem is that if you have lower environmental uh, rules, for example, at the European level, each country decides lower European constraints at the, at the national level. That is the main problem. So the European, le, le, uh, the European Union is uh, no more able to decide a very common agricultural policy. So each member state can decide many things uh, for implementing common agricultural policy. But on my mind, this is not uh, uh, good uh, news for, uh, for the environmental and social issues. Uh, I do not have much time, so I just want to, to, con to conclude with that. Which, which are the main effects of all of this. Because of the deregulation of markets, farm prices are more and more volatile with a risk uh, of overproduction, stronger uh, economic difficulties. Um, prices also are well below the cost production for most of the productions because of this deregulation of prices. And subsidies, so the huge subsidies which have to compensate farmers for the, de for the decrease of farm prices, these subsidies per hectare do not vary according, fa according farm revenues, do not vary according farm employment, do not vary according to environmental services. And uh, <laughs> finally, uh, there are still high inequalities of distributions per worker as the expense of farms with the best environmental good side practices, of farms maintaining employment better than, than the others, and uh, at the expense of some other, other products like fruits and vegetables, which we say very low payments. Uh, anyway, uh, the problem is that even if we have decoupled payments, uh, which are uh, considered as a WTO like uh, payments, which do not create uh, distortions of competition, even of these decoupled payments, these subsidies are still denounced by some sort of source countries or USA today. Uh, and in the same time, I would like to finish with that. Uh, so there is a deregulation of, uh, of prices, but there is also uh, a decrease of custom duties and environmental and health regulation. 
by free trade agreements, and especially, uh, for example, I, 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 could, uh, I could explain to you the effects of the agreement between Canada and European Union, and all the impacts uh, on uh, health and environmental regulations. And yeah, so there is a question because of the W agreement, the WTO agreement in uh, 94, but there is also the impacts of free trade, uh, bilateral free trade agreements uh, on agricultural markets. Okay, I do not have time for this. <laughs> no, and this is, uh, I just want to finish with that. This is what we defend uh, in the platform, uh, uh, in the European platform of European food sovereignty, but it is also uh, um, defended by many researchers, economists, and agronomists, and so on in, uh, in Europe. Because, uh, for example, we, we, write, we wrote a report uh, 10 years ago, which was uh, signed by many, many researchers uh, with uh, these proposals. So we, we think that we have to uh, create against tools for regulating market, markets with warranted prices for a volume kept for each farm. Obviously, uh, there were limits of, uh, of the former cap. And so for maintaining familial farms, we have also to uh, cap the subsidies per farm. And uh, also to maintain quotas uh, of production when the situation of markets is, uh, uh, is very bad. Uh, we, we are also for keeping strong borders measures and strong environmental and social conditions for benefiting from the guaranteed prices. So we say, okay, farmers, you can benefit from uh, stabilized prices and, uh, and, uh, uh, and decent incomes, but you have to uh, answer to uh, stronger environmental and social conditions. And so in this context, we think that all subsidies should be, um, sh should be uh, paid according to farm practices, organic farming, direct short supply chains, and so on. And a final proposal, which is, to my mind, uh, very interesting, uh, also, uh, which is also a policy of demand, is to uh, oblige every, um, every school meal, every collective meal, uh, to be based on local products and uh, organic farming products which is not the case today because of, uh, uh, of the national policies, but also of, uh, of uh, the competition rules. And uh, we think that it's also a, a kind of creating more demand for these local agricultural products. So uh, I'm sorry for this uh, time, very long time of presentation, uh, in fact. Uh, And um, then we will pass to some sustainability issues on the worldwide level. And uh, first, we would like to uh, focus a bit on the argumentation that was developed in the report uh, that we read for, for the presentation of today and to discuss a bit um, the institutional limits that were recognized in the report and that were criticized, and also the current configuration of the CAP in relation to the future prospects for its evolution that were uh, discussed there. This is the text of the report. Uh, so, uh, what was mainly criticized uh, was basically the division of the CAP uh, and of the subsidies that are being provided through it into uh, pillars and the absorption of the greatest part of the funds by, the, by pillar one, which is dedicated to the direct payments to individual beneficiaries uh, on the basis of the total uh, land that is being possessed and farmed. And uh, this was considered to be problematic if taking into account um, the, the wider context of the polarization of the land possession that is uh, characteristic 
of, uh, of the European Union. Um, and when considering that um, this kind of polarization is putting uh, smaller holdings into, it, uh, into, into an unfavorable position for having access to these subsidies, uh, in contrast to the um, bigger and large scale uh, farms, which are able to, to secure for, the, for themselves the greatest part of the, of the subsidies that are being provided. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the subsidies that are being um, uh, allocated through Pillar 2 uh, mechanisms are more strongly linked to wider goals of uh, rural development or environmental uh, policies. And this is why in the report, Pillar 2 was considered to provide a more um, promising context for uh, the transformation of the European agricultural sector uh, in future towards a more um, sustainable uh, direction. So uh, a precondition that was also um, recognized was that there has to be a prioritization of, um, of Pillar 2 over Pillar 1 in the allocation of the budget and a prioritization also of uh, some goals that have to be more explicitly incorporated and linked to the absorption of the funds by the, the, the individual farmers and of course relating to both social dimensions of the desertification of rural areas of um, the loss and disappearance of small and medium scale uh, farms and also a uh, more environmental dimensions that are relating to uh, the adoption of uh, more sustainable practices, uh, such as organic farming, for, for example, or the mitigation of the ecological impact uh, that farming has. Uh, however, we would like to turn to a short historical overview uh, from a more critical perspective of the role that CAP has come to play uh, over the years. Um, and except for a more critical take on that, um, on that role, which is uh, as also recognized by the presentation that we saw, both socially and environmentally problematic. Uh, maybe that could also help to, um, it would be interesting maybe to see also the tension that exists between this role and the green rhetoric that has been, uh, in, that has been adopted increasingly over, at, at the same time by these same policies. So historically, CAP has been established as an attempt to um, enlargement and modernization of the productive units, uh, something that is exemplified in the rhetoric of the Manshold Plan of 1968, uh, which had the stated purpose of reducing both the population that was employed in the agricultural sector and the number of the productive units uh, that were active. So that more than an attempt to towards the centralization of the agricultural production in the EU was also an attempt for um, an agricultural uh, model based on productivity and efficiency through uh, mechanization and large scale uh, production. And um, in the end, maybe it was also an attempt to introduce capitalist characteristics into a European countryside that up to then could hardly be characterized as being capitalistic and uh, was mainly dominated by um, peasant uh, structures and by capitalist farms here, maybe we could denote farms that are uh, employing wage labor, that are engaging in commodity production and that are um, operating under the imperative of uh, increasing profitability and of uh, utilizing labor saving techniques. So at the same time, uh, a discursive turn can be observed beginning from the 1980s onwards, um, which was more clearly crystallized into the reform of the, of the CAP that, the, um, that was inaugurated in 1992 and that um, signified both the decoupling of the provision of subsidies from productivity and production aims, and at the same time, the introduction of the need to accompany these subsidies by more environmentally oriented uh, measures of uh, protection from the side of the farms receiving the subsidies. Uh, so we can see that there has been a generalized shift of rhetoric from away from the productivism of the previous decades and more towards um, an ideal of small-scale family-based uh, farming, 
which uh, wasn't uh, accompanied by a similar shift uh, in practice away from the agro-industrial uh, model, which is something that continued to, to dominate. And uh, this is evident, not only the discussion about, about concentration of land that we had already, uh, it's also evident if we take into account the fact that um, the European agricultural sector continues to be uh, energy intensive, um, capital intensive, heavily mechanized, and also rely relying on high consumption of intermediate inputs. The other side of which is, of course, uh, the high level of cheap imports that are required from developing countries uh, and the high level of exports that uh, the European Union has been able to secure for itself in the arena of international uh, competition, which is something that Eloisa is going afterwards to uh, elaborate more. And uh, yeah, so in the end, we can see that the decoupling of the provision of subsidies from the goals of productivity um, hasn't challenged in, in any meaningful way, maybe, um, the large scale um, capitalist uh, structure of uh, the agricultural sector that existed up to then. And it is, on this ba it, it is in this context that we would like to point out that um, the reforms of uh, CAP that are being proposed by, by the report that we read um, imply in their essence a radically different logic uh, a logic of small scale, uh, more sustainable farming that is that is very different from the logic that is um, underpinning the structure of the agricultural sector right now, both internally and on the international level. And in that case, maybe we could um, ask ourselves to what extent, uh, even if there is some uh, reorientation of funds from pillar one to pillar two, if that would be enough to challenge the structures that exist and to impose radically different ones. And uh, an example that we could um, see here, and also if taking into account the fact that there has been a green rhetoric already well underway, and in many cases, uh, this rhetoric has been perfectly able to be adjusted to and incorporated to the whole system in ways that are not uh, har that are harmless in the end for the agro-industrial model that is um, that is dominating right now. And this is evident, maybe if we have a look at the organic farming, uh, which has been one of the main dimensions of uh, pillar two uh, programs, if not one of the main ones, uh, an important one at least. And indeed in the last decades, we have seen an increase of these organic farming practices, even if uh, as we saw in the presentation, these practices remain marginal. But even if we look at what these practices are uh, and what they imply, we can see that there has there have been many voices casting doubts upon whether these are organized in a different logic than the agro-industrial uh, model of agricultural production, because in many cases, as we can see, for example, in that uh, table, on average, uh, organic farming tends to be more concentrated than conventional farming. It tends to be um, capital intensive and heavily mechanized, and even sometimes engaging in uh, monoculture activities. So this is from my side. Thank you, Lina. Thank you very much, Professor Trivé, for the presentation. Um, I would like to address some sustainability issues uh, the CAP may, um, may propose in, uh, in outside Europe as well. Like the underlining question is, is CAP shifting problems abroad? So I would like to turn into uh, international trade to start. Uh, I would argue that the CAP allows Europe to maintain a dominant position in the world trade, be there through the exports because uh, the export subsidies, as we saw, they uh, artificially cut the prices by dumping products uh, coming from uh, on the world markets. And that's very ruinous for small farmers in developing countries, especially, but also through imports due to the uh, strong import capacity Europe has. Uh, the, uh, the European Union is nowadays the third main uh, agri-food importer in the world. And this has been key 
for Europe to uh, mitigate the impacts of COVID-19, uh, social economic impacts here and sustain uh, the prices uh, in a low level. I would like to show, this is a very updated uh, figure from 2020, from a report that was just released by the European Commission of the top partners, the top agri-food uh, partners in international trade. We can see that uh, the, the European Union uh, imports um, mostly products from the United Kingdom, uh, Brazil, the United States. Uh, but Brazil, it's a special case, I would say, not only because of the soy exports, but also because we can see that um, he's like one of the few countries along with Ukraine and Turkey that actually export more food than import from Europe. So it is uh, an interesting case I would like to focus on, not only because I also know the reality a bit more because I'm Brazilian myself, but uh, I would like to comment, for instance, what happened during the pandemic with the food inflation. As we can see, uh, this first graph is food inflation month by month since the beginning of the pandemic until now in the European Union. And this is food inflation in Brazil. We may see, like from a first, uh, from a first side, we may see some complementarity between those two graphics. And also, uh, it is a very important feature the different magnitudes of such uh, price uh, raising. We see that in Europe, press, uh, the increased cost in food was uh, varied among 0.1% and 3.1% in the period. And in Brazil, it started increasing from uh, almost 5% and over 15% in some months. And this uh, impact in food prices in Brazil is accumulating with devastating social effects in a country that uh, is already passing uh, uh, through a process of uh, continuing impoverishment and unemployment. And this is the face of uh, the high cost of food in Brazil right now. This is a photo taken in September. It shows a truck filled with uh, butchery leftovers, uh, mainly in bones, and the population getting population not able to get uh, meat in the supermarkets getting food from uh, from this truck and it is like uh, it illustrates a reality in brazil right now which is a reality of hunger uh, 19 million brazilians uh, are experiencing uh, hunger right now this is a chile is a chile of hungry people inside brazil and also the same survey which is a big survey that was made um, uh, shows that 55% of the population has experienced some level of food insecurity during the last year. So, of course, this is not only an impact uh, from uh, international trade. Uh, there were some domestic decisions that led into this situation. We may, we may comment on the depletion of programs like Zero Hunger. We may comment also in the, um, in the elimination of stocks uh, in, within the last decade. Brazil had um, reduced its storage in grains in 96% and zeroed the, the storage in rice and, uh, and soya. And uh, the, government, um, the government says that these measures were getting too costly because of the volatility of prices. Like they, can, they argue that they could not do more because prices were too high and there is a, um, a threshold for buying these grains. But this means actually that food is absolutely expensive in Brazil right now, especially for the poor. And also there is another fact that at the same time all this is happening, the agribusiness sector in Brazil is uh, breaking records of profits. Uh, in, during the pandemic in 2020, uh, the sector has increased its, its GDP in almost 25%. And we can see that um, this is a problem that may get worse in the following years uh, due to some liberalization uh, measures that we can see in, in international trade, uh, in especially through a study case I wanna, br I wanna bring up, which is the European Union-Mercosur uh, agreement. 
Well, what is this agreement? Uh, this is an agreement on flexibilizing quotas of imports and exports between the two blocks. We know Mercosur entails uh, Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And this has been up to negotiations since the 2000s, like within the liberalization wave of the, te of the time. And it's, uh, the negotiation process was relaunched in May, in May 2016. During, the, uh, during a time in which we had very liberalized presidents um, in front, like we had the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff that year, and we also had uh, a very liberal president in Argentina. And also uh, what happened is, was that in 2009, this agreement was sealed. Uh, it, it is already signed, but the regulation and the the, the, lead, the details for its implementation, uh, they require approval by the European Parliament. The, uh, this is a quote from a newspaper saying that due to the political context, this may not happen before 2023 because of French ele elections and Brazilian elections. But the thing is that there is a strong trade trend for this agreement to be approved. And what does it entail? As you can see, it entails like uh, enlarging quotas uh, for exports from Mercosur to European Union, mostly in these products. Uh, soybean quotas has, have not been determined yet, but on beef, soybean, poultry, sugar, ethanol, and rice. And from the European Union to Mercosur, like huge increases in the imports of uh, mostly milk derivatives, uh, milk and milk products. So uh, as you can see, this is, these are the main commodities that would, be, um, that would be addressed by this agreement. And we can also see that it will have, according to the estimations of this association called GRAIN, um, which is Spanish-based, uh, we can see that it would mean also a huge increase in the emissions due, uh, in uh, CO2 emissions due to this enlargement of the trade. Now, I would like to address some questions of this agreement in terms of environmental and health issues. Uh, this is a researcher from Brazil. Her name is Larissa Bombardi. She's currently exilated in Brazil because, because of this research she led. She's exilated here in Europe. She needed to leave Brazil because she received death threats, threats after presenting uh, her work at the parliament. And I would like to show just a couple of minutes of her presentation uh, among these agreements. And um, they, these uh, pesticides, they have like, and, and there's also like a huge pressure in the frontier of uh, the agricultural frontier from Brazil, like which is like uh, advancing, uh, advancing through the Amazon. So we have, Pesticides coming back for Europe. We have pesticides in poison people in a large scale and her research is very groundbreaking on that. She was able to gather data from all states, uh, just, just uh, representing how much, uh, how the big magnitude this issue has in Brazil. And so we have the question of pesticides, the advance of the agricultural frontier and the economy make unbalance. Oh, we must, we can just okay, go on. Okay. No, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just see if it goes. Okay. Here. So here's the research uh, and I strongly advise you guys to take a look. It is translated in English. Uh, it's 2019. And um, here are some numbers uh, that show like how um, how, this, uh, how is the imbalance uh, between pesticides between uh, Brazil and the European Union work? Like in Brazil, uh, we have in 2015, 2017, these are the pesticides uh, of, um, these are the pe pesticides authorized in cultures in Europe, in Brazil, uh, that are not authorized in Europe. And how many of those different pesticides were used uh, by crops? So we have peanuts, banana, coffee, sugar cane, citrus, eucalyptus, maize, and soybean. So the fact that the columns are rising year by year showed that the, the increase in the use of uh, pesticides in Brazil for one side. And also it shows that all these pesticides, they, are not, uh, they should not be um, 
accepted in the European Union, but these products are though exported by Brazil. We see, for instance, in the example of soy, uh, in the European Union, uh, the European Union allows 3.3 uh, times less pesticide than we are used to use in soybean crops in Brazil. These are, uh, these are the countries that most import soybean crops. We see Netherlands, Germany, uh, Netherlands, Germany, Spain, France, and Slovenia uh, in order. And this soybean uh, is, used, is used mostly in meal, but it's also, also used for, uh, for food for, for the population. Also, the environmental impact, we see that soy crops uh, occupy an area of almost 11 Belgians in Brazil, which, which is more or less 102% 100, of the area of Germany. And we see, we see that they are advancing through the Amazonia region as well, but they already devastated the ecosystems in the central Brazil. And this is a, this is a graph that shows like the darker areas are the areas that has, uh, have had most cases of food, uh, of pesticide intoxication in Brazil. And we see like the, there is a very dark area just below the Amazon, which shows like the pesticides are closely linked with um, the, the advance of the frontier and these health issues cases in Brazil. So we have a couple of questions to Edward. Yeah, so just for the questions, the first one would be um, concerning some dimension of uh, asymmetries, not only on the international level, but also within the EU. Uh, could we maybe go beyond the image of uh, net contributors and net recipients of the European budget and the CAP budget more specifically in order to, to take into account the differential capacities for accessing the subsidies based on the different structures of the agricultural sector in terms of size and productivity, particularly mm -hmm. as far as the countries of the recent uh, Euro Eastern enlargements of the EU are concerned, Romania, for example, or Hungary. And uh, the second question would be that considering um, the dependence and the demand that uh, the European agriculture has for foreign food and uh, feed inputs uh, and the impacts that this demand has for countries like Brazil producing those inputs, um, impacts linked to the, uh, the emissions via land use change and transport, human and animal health, uh, the advance of the agricultural fr frontier and so on, then what kind of measures could be integrated into the CAP to take account of these uh, impacts and reduce them, maybe. Thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> the Okay. Um, well, okay. uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting. And just would like to answer to some to your questions. And perhaps we could have then a, a dialogue together about your presentation and mine. Um, so first of all, I, I would like to react on, on some points about CAP and uh, common agricultural policy. You say that there, there was a, a new if, if I well understood, there, is a, a, there, is a new, there are new objectives uh, to, um, to develop small and familiar production uh, farms uh, into the cap, that's it. So you, you say that there, is a, a, there are new discourses on small and familiar production and uh, that we need this small and familiar production. I'm not sure about that. In, uh, into the objectives of the new cap, there is no uh, there is no objective of small and familiar production, not at all. Um, on the contrary, um, in the in the uh, until the the IT, uh, there was uh, an attempt to maintain uh, medium sized farms or not to. Uh, too high, uh, too big farms anyway, uh, especially in France. 
Um, so the objective was a farm with one or two full employment farmers, um, but not very big capitalist farms. Anyway, now the discourse in France and in other European countries is that we want entrepreneurial, it's, it's fine, entrepreneurial farms, which means farms uh, with a farmer, okay, but with many salaries from the farmers, <laughs> and uh, and not uh, this is this is no more a familial farm uh, objective anyway, and. Uh, it depends also. Uh, it depends also on the countries because um, since uh, since for I, I don't know for ten or twenty years, the fact is that each country can decide how it distributes the subsidies. And for example, in France, um, for the last reform in two thousand thirteen. The ministry, the ministry of Agriculture, Stéphane Le Foll, um, said, "Okay, we are for we, we want to support small and uh, medium-sized farms because it uh, um, it is uh, it benefits to the employment. Okay, because uh, big farms with big farms you, you have low employment for uh, per per hectare anyway. So." Uh, France decided to uh, have um, higher subsidies for um, little farms or for the 50 uh, first hectares of farms. I don't know if you understand. So for the 55, uh, for the 50, 55 hectares, first hectares of farms, the subsidy is higher, okay? But the ministry say, okay, we want uh, uh, we want a subsidy of 50, uh, 50 euros per hectare. Uh, no, 100, 100 uh, euros per hectare. Finally, the FNSEA, the Farm Trade Union say, okay, we do not want this because uh, we, we want also big farms and so on. This is a progress. And, and finally, the decision was uh, 50 euros per hectare for the 51st, 55 first hectares. And finally, we, we, we made simulations and so on, and it had no impacts, no impacts on distribution, on redistribution. This means then that if, um, even if there is uh, some countries which wants to redistribute, in each country, the lobby of the main farm trade union is so high, so, so, so strong, then all these kind of measures for litter farms disappear anyway, or are dis dismantled or weakened and so on. And uh, anyway, at the European level, there is no objective for uh, sustaining, for supporting little farms. This is not an objective, okay? This is just an option for countries who want to do this. And in France, we try to do this, but finally, the lobby of the FNSA was so strong that it disappeared finally in the concrete impacts. So the final measures was so weak that it disappeared, uh, that the final impacts were, were finally uh, very weak anyway. And um, for example, in Romania, you know that the many, perhaps half of the farms are uh, um, uh, have less than three hectares, one hectares anyway, and for obtaining sub direct subsidies, you need to have more than one hectare. That is a way to select all farms, and that is why all the direct subsidies are so concentrated into the same very big farms. So I wouldn't say that, uh, so the objectives are really not to support little farms and the final impacts and final measures, concrete measures are really not in favor to these little farms. This is really a problem because the familial agriculture, the familial agriculture is an objective of the United uh, Unions, uh, United Nations and uh, the food agriculture organization. This is clear, but not the European Union. And this is really not uh, what is uh, 
um, what is the concrete objective now of the CAP and the national uh, application of the CAP. And uh, so the problem is that so uh, familial, familial farming is clearly uh, being weakened during this period. And so, and, and secondly, the problem is that in these little farms, you have more uh, employment per hectare. So with the concentration of farm, uh, th this big farm uh, managed to be competitive thanks to uh, a labor productiv a higher pro labor productivity. For example, in Romania, it means thousands of hectares per farm of cereals with very, uh, a very low, low employment rates. And this is a problem in a country which, uh, in, in which the, 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 the rate of unemployment is perhaps 10 or, or, of it, of, or 15 percent. So, um, secondly, about the, yeah, uh, when you, uh, I would like to react on the question of Brazil. This is a very good example of impacts of trade agreements, free bilateral free trade agreements. And uh, there is clearly a problem, as you, as you said, of unauthorized uh, uh, phytosanitary products, pesticides, and so on uh, in Europe compared to the countries uh, which export towards Europe, as Brazil, but as Canada, as the United States, and so on. And we conclude free trade agreements with countries uh, to decrease or to uh, uh, to dismantle all the the duty with these countries, but with unequal rules, uh, environmental rules. And for example, it is clear that Brazil and Canada can produce with some phytosanitary products, which is not possible, which are not possible in Europe. And there, there is um, in for the future cap. So, which will be implemented uh, in 2023, the final, the, the, the future cap. Uh, there was an attempt of the European Parliament to, uh, to oblige to uh, control and to uh, refuse projects from the outside, with uh, which use unauthorized. Uh, phytosanitary products and so on, to take into account environmental and social conditions for the, for the importations. But it was refused by the Council of Ministers, finally, by the European Council of Ministers of European Unions. So anyway, France has a position on that, which is quite uh, in favor of taking into account these conditions. But anyway, there is no uh, compromise at European Union for the uh, seven uh, uh, next years, because you know that the cap is implemented for the seven next years. Uh, I, I, I just would like also to add some things about the next uh, cap for the next seven years <coughs> with two main aspects, because we, we had the vote of the European Parliament uh, seven weeks ago about this. and. I, uh, I would say that there are two aspects. One is uh, a, a stronger nation nationalization of the cap. So it will mean stronger uh, rooms of maneuver for each country. Secondly, in France, the result is that a perfect, it is a perfect conservative policy. So we had a diagnostic which is very critical about the cap. I was very happy with the diagnostic one year ago. I thought, oh, okay, there is, there is a big change. It's, it's amazing. Uh, they take into account that there is a problem, uh, an environmental and social issue, and we were very happy. But finally, the result is that the cap will don't change. <laughs> and I, I'm very happy because I, I, I don't have to change my license for the next cap. <laughs> because this is the same one. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it's amazing because the minister was very, um, was very clear. Uh, he said, we don't want to change anything. He said, um, he said uh, farmers have 
uh, face to very high uh, economic stakes uh, challenges and for that we do and, and yeah he said for agroecological transformation we don't have to change uh, cap distributions uh, cap subsidies distribution it was amazing and uh, <laughs> so uh, they um, uh, they so they, they 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 say very clearly and honestly that they don't want to change distribution of cap subsidies and that's why the the future eco scheme which is a uh, uh, so for the greening of caps, there is a new tool, which is the eco scheme. 25% uh, of direct cap subsidies, and uh, it is uh, considered as an uh, environmental revolution. Anyway, the Minister of Agriculture in France wrote very clearly, it has to be uh, accessible yes, uh, to every farmer. <laughs> so, <laughs> So uh, yeah, so we have uh, to, so conclusion is that every environmental conditions has have to be the lowest, the, the lowest possible lowest and uh, lowest possible. Lowest as, uh, as lowest as possible, thank you. <laughs> and uh, the, the, yeah, the conclusion is that uh, uh, all conditions are very, very low. And, uh, and so it, it, it won't change anything uh, or, or not on not at a systematic level uh, even if we need this systematic uh, transformation and there is one point which is a uh, more um we, we which is also so which is uh, uh, quite a concern is that um the new logic very clearly explained by the minister in france is that for agroecological transformation we need uh, machines robots genetics and uh, uh, numeric digital digitalization so yeah so this is a new spirit of agricultural transformation <laughs> so uh, you know uh, uh, drones and uh, gps and so on and uh, this is really a problem for, for the in-depthness of uh, farms. Uh, also a problem because it means uh, more uh, uh, fossil energy for producing these machines and so on. Uh, it is not at all um, for promoving rotation crops, crops of rotation and so on. So this is completely uh, contrary to what we should to what we should make for this agricultural transformation and uh, so yeah I, I would say that so the so i'm very anyway i'm very pessimistic with the with the orientation and i would say that in the last reform in 2013 we had attempts to uh, to go further in the cap because there was this uh, there was this uh, green payments with new conditions anyway, even if the French managed to, low, to, lower, uh, to have lower <laughs> conditions. Uh, we had a commissioner of agriculture, Dacian Shulos, uh, I was counselor uh, of this commissioner, which, were, were, uh, which was uh, in favor, who was in favor of, the, of little farms and so on, even if it was not into the objective, but he tried to make options for countries for distributing better the subsidies. And even if I was critical of him, the minister of France in France was, uh, yeah, he, he didn't consider agroecology only with robots, machine, and so on. And the fact is that now we have a commissioner and a commission which is uh, very, uh, uh, so which, which say, okay, uh, all countries do, do what they want. And in the country with, uh, with, with a minister like in France, which is uh, very aligned with the interest of, uh, of the main trade union, nothing will happen, uh, nothing new will happen anyway. And uh, first, um, yeah, final thing is about the Green Deal. You know, there is a Green Deal at the European level. And into the Green Deal, there is a farm uh, part of this green deal 
The name is uh, farm to fork, the strategy farm to fork. And this strategy farm to fork says we want 25% uh, of uh, surface dedicated to organic farming. We want uh, a decrease of 50% of phytosanitary products and so on. Very strong and very ambitious objective until 2030. Very great. But France and other countries, 20 countries, I think, they oppose to the European Commission, a commissioner, for evaluating the national application uh, relatively to the Green Deal objectives. That means, and they obtain that, that means that the CAF and the national ob application do not have any legal obligation to, um, to try to answer to the Green Deal objectives. It means something that the Green Deal is only discursive because when we have very concrete policies with very concrete subsidies, there is uh, so all countries manage, not all countries, about 20 countries, manage to obtain that there is no evaluation as regards to these objectives. Uh, for example, France, which say, oh, yes, we have very partner, big partners of the Green Deal and so on. But concretely, in the negotiations, they just want not to respect this engagement because they, 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 they knew that their national application wouldn't respect this objective. This is very clear. For example, organic farming, we are going to uh, to dismantle all organic farming subsidies for maintaining organic farming. There will be only subsidies for transforming into organic farming the farms, but not for maintaining the farms, as it was the case before. So how could how could we say that we want to to <laughs> to, uh, to 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 respect these objectives? Uh, if we uh, if we do not have any more this kind of subsidies for the concerning phytosanitary products, there is an increase of phytosanitary products use uh, during the last 20, uh, 20 years. This is in the statistic, in the very official statistics, and we don't have any other new measure which can prove that we are uh, we are answering to this challenge. So. Conclusion is that we are trying to uh, not to respect legally this uh, this objective. Um, what? No. Or do you have questions? Perhaps yes, maybe we can take some questions. Where are the questions? Please. Let's hope it works. Okay. You can speak. I have to uh, a question that I have. Uh, we learned about the uh, agroecology. We had a seminar already about it and about all the problematics regarding the agriculture nowadays and one of the main arguments of uh, the mainstream approach <coughs> it's that we would not uh, be able to produce enough food without this uh, industrial model of production and then we usually <coughs> talk a lot about the uh, labor productivity in uh, agriculture but i have never seen uh, studies maybe there is and i don't know about the land productivity uh, regarding the difference between the agro-industrial model and the agro-ecology <coughs> model. And you know, if there is studies about the productivity, not of the labor itself, but of the land, which one, like uh, if we would move uh, from an agro-industrial model to the agro-ecology model and organic farming, it would be enough to sustain and to feed the entire population. There is studies about it. Uh, there were reports and scientific uh, studies about that. But anyway, according to uh, the, the hypothesis you make, we don't have the same results. Anyway, uh, I can, uh, I, I know many scientific reports like from after and so on, I can send that to you, which prove that uh, with organic farming or even from ecology, agro, from with an agroecological agriculture, we can food, we can uh, we can have food for everyone. Uh, 
anyway. And what is really important to, to understand is that the main argument uh, for increasing production in Europe is that we need to feed such uh, countries. But, uh, but for, uh, for 10 or, or, or 20 years, uh, even the United Nations, even the World Bank, uh, acknowledge that uh, this is not uh, the, the, the main solution for source countries. The main solution is that, is that, main source country, so that many source countries have to be independent from the outside and that they have to develop their own uh, produ agriculture production. Because uh, we, had, uh, we had a food crisis, you know, in, two, uh, in 2008, with a very, uh, a very uh, big increase of food uh, prices into the world. And the countries which were the, the biggest victim of that were the, the countries which import the most, uh, which, which, are, who are, which are the most, the biggest importer of food products anyway, because they, they were dependent on this uh, very uh, increase, this huge increase of food uh, products. You know, so that's why even the World Bank say the, the, the main solution for that is to develop your own production in your country. And for that, uh, even the World Bank and the United Nations say uh, this solution is not to uh, develop that as uh, you, we made in the North countries, but to, uh, to develop other, uh, other kinds of, uh, for example, the storage, there is big problems of storage, of transport. Uh, we need also more, uh, more livestock and more, uh, so more uh, little machines also, even little machines, but not GMOs and so on. And so the problem is not to have more machines of more GMOs and so on in the source countries. The problem is to have very basic tools of production, very basic tools of storage of, uh, of transportation and so on, and uh, and so uh, and so it's not an industrial uh, mode of development which is needed. Uh, and some ag agronomists underline the fact that we we could implement agroecology in those countries because uh, if we do not do that, they 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 will be these agricultures will be de dependent on the on the north countries because of matches, because of chemical products and so on. So they have to develop their agriculture with less chemical products, less machines and so on. And there are uh, very big rules for maneuver for that. So their productivity is very, very low, very, very low. Perhaps thousand times their, their, product, their raw productivity is uh, perhaps thousand times lower than our productivity. And uh, this is really not uh, with a uh, big machine and so on that we this is not the way we will solve uh, the problem in South countries so i don't know if we, i answer to, to your question anyway but yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe <laughs> okay i take the yeah. sorry if i understood you right you said that we can feed everybody with ecological farming you said that we can feed everybody yeah. with ecological farming. Is this, I believe this now, but do you still believe this in a situation where let's say we decrease inequality on the planet and we have an expansion of like an European diet? Yeah. Sorry, too loud. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you think that we can still feed the world with an ecological diet, like an ecological farming under different circumstances? Mais, mais est-ce est est qu'on prend quelques questions? Parce que comme on est déjà out of, we take two or three additional questions, which will be the last question. So, au revoir. Okay. Yeah, so um, I just want to ask a question. I forgot to what you said um, during the presentation. I think on one of your slides, um, you said that um, France still falls and complying with um, the European Union nitrate directive. Yeah, so it's something that really interested me because um, I come from Nigeria and presently 
um, most of the farming practice is still based on um, this um, nitrate fertilizers. So like they really use it on the federal government. We really have like um, so many subsidy schemes that support some of this um, nitrate based fertilizer. So like, I'm just thinking, I know it sort of, it is problematic for the environment and the health because um, like in some studies, they try to say like um, when these children, they consume um, this um, nitrate based water, then it causes this um, blue baby syndrome and for adults, like it causes some um, health uh, that's uh, like um, the heart related diseases and all that. So in your opinion, I'm just like, what other alternative, like a sustainable alternative that is going to um, reduce this environmental and health risks? Okay, is there a question? Yeah, I'll just I mean, it, it links to what Valentin was saying. For me, like one of the major problems is just our massive meat consumption, especially in Europe, but also in, in the US and generally the global north. What's your best solution to just, well, reduce meat consumption by 90% and, and more possibly, how do we get that done? Yes, I, I think the ratio of vegetarian people is just really no, no, yeah, um, yeah, of course, of course. We cannot consume in all over the world as a European consumer and as a, an American consumer, or to, be, to be honest. If, if everyone consumes the, the, two, the, the calculations, uh, means that if everyone in the world consumes like a European consumer, we need five planets to, uh, uh, to feed everyone. <laughs> so yeah, it's true that another uh, lever, lever for uh, solving the, pro the, the, the situation is to reduce our consumption of meat. That's why I think we, we would need to, uh, on my mind, we will need to, sub, to, uh, to move out every subsidy for meat production and so on, but to increase prices of meat, problem is that, okay, the poor couldn't uh, have meat. <laughs> problem is that if, if you increase the prices of meat, of milk production and so on, it will mean that uh, every poor consumer is not able to uh, to buy uh, meat, product, meat products and so on. That's why you cannot imagine agricultural policies alone. That means that we have to increase the minimal wage or the minimal uh, incomes for uh, allowing everyone to buy uh, a nutritional and, uh, and, and the safe, um, safe uh, uh, food. You know, that's why uh, we, we, we need uh, more, uh, we, we need uh, higher, higher wages uh, for, for everyone, or at least uh, less inequalities of wealth. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, I don't know if, you, if, there is, if there are other questions, I, I don't remember, sorry, about the environmental questions yeah. and so on. Either. I mean, nitrate, nitrate Yeah, in the South countries, or near, like, you know, you said it, you need environment, and they do not have, like, the European directive, and you use it in the developing countries, I mean, it won't. Yeah, sure. You know, we, we use fertilizer, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. This is, uh, so, what, what could we do in the European countries, anyway, uh, face to this? <laughs> I, I think that we have, to, uh, we, we do not have to import products with unauthorized uh, phytosanitary products in European Union. That means that we have to, um, uh, we have to oblige all importers to respect the rules that we have in European Union. But I, I, would, I would like to, I would like to say that there is also a problem in France anyway, because in France, if we decide, for example, not to have, uh, not to, to have uh, 
food with pesticides, we have a problem because uh, there is a free market in European Union. So the problem is that if we want to do that at, uh, in France, so you know there, there are, there are, there are uh, some candidates who say we do not want uh, food with pesticides and so on. Okay, if you say that, we have also to refuse any importations, any imports of food and agricultural products uh, which uh, uh, which was uh, treated with uh, with uh, some pesticides, and this is really uh, uh, so we question directly the European Union and the treaties anyway, and the and the core of the European treaties. This means that if you do not want any food with pesticides, we have to refuse any imports with pesticides. And in this case, we have to refuse, uh, we have to disobey to European treaties, uh, to European un Union rules, to, uh, to free trade agreements, and so on. I, I think we should do that anyway, because all, today there is a huge problem of health because of that. Anyway. But we cannot oblige other countries outside the European Union, they do that what they want anyway. Uh, this means the food sovereignty, the food sovereignty is a demand of the Via Campesina and you know uh, all the peasant organization is that every region, every country has to decide its own agricultural policy according to the preference of the people. So we do not have to say in the European Union, okay, do that, uh, you, you are obliged to do that. They make that they want, but we, we could refuse any imports with pesticides and so on, and uh, at least uh, according to environmental issues. Anyway, and it's clear that it will uh, make pressure. It will make pressure on these countries. Anyway, I don't know if I am clear, mm -hmm. but I answer to your question of uh, on meat and so on. No. Uh, what solutions are complete pesticides in future? Ah, okay. Uh, what solutions, perhaps? Huh? How, how can we do? Yeah, like for me, I always think that there is some ethical value to the food that we see, not only in terms of like collective responsibility, but there is also just food that makes it fat and stupid, and there's other food which doesn't do that, maybe. So I think that's maybe something we need to get on term with in society that we really need to decide how. How we want to feed ourselves, we really need to take agency and not just let ourselves be led by like some horrible, addictive additives in some food and then go to McDonald's every day. So I'm not sure if it's like. Okay, what, what is your solution to make this? What policy? I'm, I'm actually a legal person. <laughs> I guess. What so, policy do you propose? Uh, for doing I would that? like. But for me, uh, singling out certain types of, of nutrition, for example, is very, very evident that some types of meat are way more uh, carbon intensive than other types of, mm -hmm. uh, of vegetables or something. And then just start dividing and giving different uh, different relations and like a cheaper making meat, cheaper than the cancer, or whatever, or singling out certain like chemicals that we know are not good for us, but we yeah, and then just work on a very also specific kind of idea of what is good for human beings. Yeah, just to add on that, I completely, completely agree on the like we need massive inequality, like inequality needs to be addressed completely, and poverty in Europe and unemployment, all these problems are really, really dramatic and are exploding in our faces. But at the same time, when when considering like the quality of meat people are mostly eating right now. It is just really, really bad quality. And if you compare that with a, a high quality plant-based um, uh, uh, protein, it can be cheaper, but it has to, of course, be be, sure. be introduced in like public life. People need to know, like canteen, just- Yeah, that's, that is what I propose also. Exactly. In every country, a vegetarian solution in each each day, first of all, 
perhaps uh, half of the meals without meals and animal uh, animal production anyway that that will also uh, favor uh, and uh, encourage some kinds of consumption first of all secondly about the nutrition problem a nutri score a, a very strong nutri score um, uh, etiquette Packaging. Packaging, yeah. Uh, similar to all the European countries, and, and uh, it was an influence, obviously. And um, yeah, and also about that, uh, in the canteen, so a big education of, of all children, and it exists in some uh, school meals. So a very big program of education on that. So. Just, just I, I think one of the simplest ways to do this without kind of coming on a fast way, which can I know like politically be a bit difficult, just be we end factory farms. We cannot have these factory farms, which are exactly what you were saying earlier. We've got lorries and lorries of manure coming from these farms, polluting the environment. The animals have no place whatsoever, absolutely disgusting conditions, full of uh, uh, antibiotica, all these, these, these things. Just end that, and the real price for people uh, for, for building, be, for building all this kind, yeah, will be. Uh, yeah, we can, that. but for, for forbidding that, yeah, I, I, I propose some kinds of. Uh, so you can forbid. This is clear. You can forbid uh, uh, some too big, too big farms and so on. I am, I am social democrat in this proposal so anyway, <laughs> because we have a big platform, even if. So you know, you, we have a big flat platform, even with uh, WWF and so on. So they are quite social democrats, to be clear. So we, but what we propose here is completely re revolutionary uh, compared to what is decided now at the European Union and at the French level. We completely revolutionary. So we can have uh, stronger demands as you. As you propose, I am clearly, uh, I agree totally with, with you. But anyway, uh, a, a first step was, would be, first of all, to completely uh, change the distribution of CAP subsidies, 10 billion of year in, in France, two thirds of the revenue <laughs> of the farms, uh, to, uh, to to refuse the trade free trade dream agreements as they are uh, uh, as they are now, and uh, to uh, and to to disobey to some European rules if we really want to do this, and it's clearly now a, a, a big um, a big uh, rupture, a big uh, rupture with uh, with what is actually decided anyway. But I, I agree with you. We could be. Uh, we could uh, be a uh, step forward. It's just probably like the, the, the sorry, it's one last. <laughs> I, I'm just I, like looking at the antibiotica. If they stop, like antibiotics, if they stop working, we just fuck our elder humanity. Okay, but if we forbid that in France, we have to forbid products imported with that. Yes, exactly. And you have to disobey to the European rules, to the free trade agreements, and so on. So this is a revolution, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, one last question. But, uh, <laughs> we are already over. Please, Mel. Be without the mash, you won't hear anything. So, uh, I understand that we have to do that in common, in European Union, but it's also something that we can raise a voice for. Like, we don't, of course, uh, it has to, to, to be global decision, but one country can also raise the voice and say, oh, we should stop, or like, Start the discussion. So I agree that this is like we are limited by the fact that we have to uh, advance in the same as with all the European countries. But at the same time, it doesn't uh, block us to raise the voice and just say that okay, what we should. And <clears throat> something else um, is I have many of my friends they are doing like uh, in the uh, the yeah economy economic course. school or no? economic school. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they talk. Um, they they speak about the uh, some. I think it one was one startup called Agrolink, 
and also la chambre des agriculteurs which is like a really awesome movement that uh, when we're speaking about solution that we can uh, think it 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 can be really nice because if we promote that and make them uh, having more funds it it could change a lot of things according to like well from what i think but i don't know what you think about it so for people who don't know uh, agrolic is like a community of uh, agriculture that work together and they they are uh, help from engineers to change into like the ecological transition and um and making with like the, the in the best way to not spend too much money and actually have benefit from that so that they and they can also like um meet between members and that raise something and maybe also help each other and create a community of um <coughs> Agro League, you know, maybe, yeah. Okay. I don't know if you think it can be one of the questions. Just a way about chambers of agriculture. It exists in France, in Germany, and so on. They are uh, directed, they are managed, they are uh, directed by uh, main trade union, main farm trade union. <laughs> so the problem is that, uh, and they are in charge of uh, the council and uh, many measures uh, towards the farmers. That is the problem. That the, the main tool, the main intense instance for, uh, for implementing councils and so on for farmers is directed by the fa main farm trade union. So the FNSR has a very huge uh, Space, uh, very huge uh, empowerment on, the, on that. Okay, my first question was if you arrive at uh, the flower in the next month, uh, will you <laughs> ask for the country to disobey first before the others? <laughs> <laughs> I am for that. Anyway. No, I think we should try to change things at the European Union in, in the same time, disobey only for very good environmental and social reasons and only for this <laughs> which is quite very important in the in the, in the period <laughs> with the poland poland polish uh, yeah or the, uh, the, the discourse of the war for example because uh, so this is not quite the same reason for this with the european union <laughs> Okay, so maybe we have the, the we stop, we have the break. If you want to continue? <laughs> <laughs>